Great. Well, uh, thanks for sticking around. I assure you I'm hungry, so uh, we should be able to go through this pretty quickly. Um, first, a uh, little bit of background. Um, this is, uh, I'm going to speak about uh, my father's archives, Doug Engelbart's archives, and then uh, a little bit about what his work informed for the future of all of this. And so the story in a nutshell is uh, after he, the day after he got engaged with my mom, he started thinking about uh, his career goals. And so within a few months, he figured out that what he really wanted to do was do something that would be really important to help the world. And to do that, he could concentrate on helping people work more effectively together on really complex, urgent problems because the world already can't cope with what we have on our plate. And it's just getting more and more out of control, scaling up globally. And uh, so we have to get much, much, much better on an exponential scale. And so how do you do that? And so he thought, well, computers could help. And we could have screens. We could have uh, you know, huge information spaces. And, um, and so he had that I idea. Uh, by 1960, early 1960, he had some funding to start putting his ideas down on paper, and he developed a 160-page report uh, called Augmenting the Human Intellect, and that became sort of the seminal work that launched his, his work. He, he got his funding after this to start a research lab, and within a few years, he had already some prototypical stuff working. He had uh, computer software that started enabling people to work together. They had to pioneer the display technology, push the envelope on that, uh, interactive aspect to it, um, inventing the mouse, all that before 1964. That's the mouse right there in the uh, right-hand bottom corner of the, uh, the original mouse carved out of wood. Um, by 1967, they were using it fully operationally inside their own lab to support their own collective intelligent um, work, including software code and all of that was all on there, and um, using it for meeting support. And uh, by 1968, he gave a public demo of all the stuff that they had put together so far, and that's uh, now called the mother of all demos, and uh, that's available in the archives uh, as well. Um, the, uh, in 1969, he got added into the very first computer network, uh, which was the ARPANET, and he was, his lab at SRI <clears throat> was the second node on there with UCLA. They tested out the connection of the network, and then they added uh, Utah and uh, UC Santa Barbara, and then it expanded from there, and then networks, more networks, and then interconnected, and that became the internet. So he was the, you know, basically the first transmission on what's now the internet, and, um, and, and in his lab then they became the Network Information Center, and that ended up spinning off into its own entity, the Network Information Center, uh, headed up by Jake Feinler. Um, I put this marker in here in 1978, that's when I entered the picture. I graduated from uh, college in, uh, with a bachelor's degree in cultural anthropology with a special interest in organizational behavior, and I finally realized, oh, my dad's work is not all about tools. What you see here is all the tools. That's a tangible step. But really, 90% of what he thinks about and cares about is organizations and people. And how effectively they can work together depends a huge amount on methods and procedures and their whole paradigm for how they're working and all of that. And I was like, cool. And so I interned in his lab and um, then was hired on to help. By now, they had customers for this uh, in, in large organizations. And so I became the customer rep. And uh, that's how I entered the picture. And I sort of on there for a few years and went off and did something else. And then uh, he made some institutional changes. And in 1988, we uh, came back together and formed the Bootstrap Institute, which is now the Doug Engelbart Institute. Uh, so that was that many years ago. And then I worked very closely with him um, you know, on and off since then. So uh, then uh, here he is in 1998, still talking about the future. He was you know, anticipating, developing, or predicting the future uh, all that time and still. So um, that's just in a nutshell. So um, what I'm doing here is presenting three talks, and this was the first one. So <laughs> what he did, and then how we're archiving it. Well, this is the other part of it, the human element, which I mentioned. The, they also, in their lab, did all the experiments in methodology, conventions, organizational roles, all that kind of stuff. And in his 1962 thing, he had developed a whole strategic approach for how to go about all of this stuff. And he came up with all this terminology, bootstrapping and all this, where you use what you build, you walk your talk, you get, and that accelerates your innovation. And that uh, he considered, I consider, to be his largest, his greatest breakthrough innovation of all was the strategic approach that got that accelerative innovation going. 
and um, then it's also about people. Uh, up, he you know, started with one person in his lab, him, and then up to 47 people. And over time, uh, there became over about uh, over a little over 100 uh, people we consider to be alumni of his group at one time or another. And um, they're all around, and they all had archives of their own. And uh, so, you know, it's a big thing. A 50-year span, very creative person. How do you do the archives? Um, so the stuff, uh, the, uh, there's photos, you know, these are obvious things, the text, tons of text, artifacts, uh, software, we have running software, we're still running it now, we ported it onto a Unix server, uh, thanks to Sun Microsystem and other people, and, um, and repositories, so there's repositories in the system, this is all about how you can work more effectively together, and you can't do that if you lose track of things and all of that, so. Uh, the repository was actually very, lots of methodology and convention went into that. Um, his personal records, calendars, logs, he had all these conventions for like, uh, you know, how he noted phone calls and how he, he had a lab book that he always kept, you know, to put notes on. That's how he invented the mouse, the idea for the mouse is he scribbled some notes on one of those things, um, et cetera. Email, all this stuff is. Uh, backup media, um, seven track, mag, tape, nine track, mag, tapes, all that, and then um, film, video, so hundreds of videos ended up in the, in the archive uh, of Toxie Gave, interviews, all that kind of stuff, um, plus videos that people sent him, so, you know, having to sort of sort out, well, does this video even have him on there, because all we know is the title of the video, and uh, it's a lot to sift through. Oral histories, audio stuff, me, uh, recorded meetings, events, workshops, all these recorded and lots of information about it. His work was, had a lot to do with how you do repository management, so a lot of stuff got saved. In fact, the only stuff that got thrown out wasn't intentional, I think, and in, uh, uh, in press. So, and there's more that's not even his. So all that stuff, the archiving then, <coughs> um, a lot of it happened real time because the system had self-archiving. Uh, functionality in it because they thought that was a very important thing because you don't want to lose track of stuff and the system should do that for you what's a computer for anyway so a lot of that happened online then they also had a methodology for offline stuff and how they had their mag tapes organized everything got a number everything got an ID number so things were printed out anything that somebody published online that they said okay here's the you know draft number three everybody look at it that got printed out and put in a binder as well so they had a backup system and uh, those binders are all uh, in the archives. Um, so then re-archiving. So, so all that stuff happened. We were moving forward with, you know, taking his vision out to the world and everything. And then uh, we started a website in 1995, mostly to get the journalists to stop calling us for his CV and his photo and all the things they asked for. So it was sort of a PR kind of thing and put some of his key articles on there so we could just link to uh, his articles instead of send them out to everybody. and. Um, that's where we started. And meantime, we had already started giving a lot of the archives to Stanford Library Special Collections and uh, Henry Lowood, and we, our relationship started what, in the 1980s, I guess, and they did an oral history of dad. Um, and then uh, rescue missions, uh, a lot of the archives were in some storage locker someplace and it flooded and you know, Henry and his crew came over and rescued a lot of the stuff and saved it, preserved it, and then they ended up making this fabulous website called the Mouse Site that has uh, some of the digital, digitized stuff, finding aids and stories, which is really wonderful. Um, then the Computer History Museum, Jake Feynman, who started the Network Information Center, uh, ended up, she had, uh, all the archives from the Network Information Center early days and also a lot of archives from the, uh, the research lab that she was part of with, uh, with my dad and the alumni. And so she took all those over to the Computer History Museum. I think uh, Paula uh, Jabloner is here um, from uh, the Computer History Museum. So Jake has gone through all of those and archived them and um, catalog them and building a finding aid and everything. It's just amazing how many linear feet of uh, shelf those things take up. Um, and the Computer History Museum now has the, the uh, Revolution exhibit, the first 2,000 years, please go see it. It's like the first 2,000 years of computing. And uh, replica of the original mouse is, is there, part of the exhibit, and a few other things from the lab. Um, 
also then uh, we hooked up with, they hooked us up with uh, Brewster Kale at the Internet Archive because we had gotten to a point of digitizing a lot of the video material and needed a way to upload it. And they said, talk to Brewster. And we came and talked to Brewster. And that was shortly after last year's personal archiving workshop. And so I started describing you know, what we're trying to do. And he goes, oh, a personal archive. <laughs> so. Uh, so Laura Milvey, who's running around helping to support the conference here, um, was assigned to help me upload these, uh, these videos. And then it was a huge job uh, figuring out the context of everything. So you get the video up there, it's just stuff. You know, what does it mean? What was it? And so finding links to, um, you know, he was speaking at a conference. Well, what conference? And so, you know, is there anything online? 1995, conference that he spoke at for in tribute to v Vinny Varbush uh, for his As We May Think article, which uh, Ted Nelson was speaking at, and Dad and uh, 11 other um, pioneers from the information, you know, for early information age, who were all inspired by his work, had a, a tribute to him, and um, that was captured on video. And we found those videos, because they had sent copies to the speakers, 11 videos from that conference. And so we were able to upload that. So I'm looking at this, OK, now how am I going to find information? It was a conference program, all that kind of stuff. It was online from 1995. They had dutifully put it. But it was on two websites, MIT and Brown. They co-hosted. And so you know, it took me days to sort out, like, well, which one is, is our, you know, it's overlapping information some. And so I ended up putting my own little web page together that consolidated all the information. And it's just amazing how these things can scale up into a huge project. But it turned out that it was the 65th anniversary of the article, As We May Think. And I thought, well, this is really cool. So um, I was actually very touched. I mean, that's another part of this work, is how touched I felt to be putting these videos from these pioneers who were inspired by a previous generation pioneer about something that became the internet and all of that. And I, I was just really moved. Um, maybe I'm the only one. but. <laughs> Um, so, and that's the thing I was getting to is, and somebody uh, mentioned earlier, context is everything. So there's all this stuff, all this, what does it mean? Like what, you know, okay, so he invented the mouse. Well, what does that mean? What was he trying to do? What was, what all was involved? You know, it was, all, it was about interactive technology so that you could be, you know, so what's the vision? How do you do this story? So I started, you know, making some pages. The mouse site is beautiful uh, at Stanford and, you know, setting the context. So he pioneered groupware. Uh, he pioneered uh, uh, networking and online communities, probably the first online community, um, first telecommuting. I mean, it, it's, it sort of goes on. So how do you scale it down to something that you can actually put on the web? So here's Father the Mouse. There's an interview of him explaining how he invented the mouse and then links to everything, links to the mouse site, links to uh, all the resources at SRI International where he did the work. and. Um, so voila, I sort of consolidated it on. We did a sort of back end first. is like, just get the stuff up there. And then I didn't have really an architecture in mind for how to sort of uh, put the umbrella or the portal into all of it. And so I put this together, which is just a start. And, um, and really, then I went to visit MIT. And I got to meet with the people, the archivists who do the Doc Edgerton archives. And they did such a beautiful job. So it's very inspired to, uh, you should go visit. It's just amazing. They have his lab notes scanned in, and it's, it's beautiful. Um, so where to go from here is learn from collections like that and network with other archivists of notable people. I know Peter Chance here from Stanford who's working on the Becky Fuller um, archive. So this thing is very exciting to me. Uh, network with people in the digital storytelling because you know, I get better at doing the context. I've been talking to people at digital museums and online exhibits that you know, how do you put all this into something that, um, that makes it meaningful. And who's coming? School children, journalists, historians. Uh, business uh, strategy analysts and all kinds of stuff. So how do you make portals for them? And uh, through them, uh, New Media Consortium, NMC, I've been engaging with faculty. And hopefully that leads to interns, volunteers, stuff like that. And um, so partnering with other uh, people doing this and, um, and funding is a question. We talked about costs earlier. It's a big thing. Uh, because this thing, it just scales up no matter what you're doing. Uh, it's huge. It's endless. Um, so objectives beyond just webifying, uh, humanizing history. So you know, people use stuff that 
that can be sourced back to his work and they have no idea. You know, the, a person, a group, a team actually did this. They, they thought about it, nothing like this. When he had these ideas, computers were for computation and, you know, interactive computing was a ridiculous idea. So he invented the mouse and that, you know, so put the human with it. And then connecting the technology to the vision because people, are, oh yeah, he invented the mouse or he did, but his vision is still actually still very relevant and um, more pressing today than ever. And, um, and to, to understand that the technology is to support how we work together and how we can have a better world by doing that. Um, and communicating the primary significance of the vision. So those are sort of my objectives. Here's our homepage that I kind of outlined those in these three boxes here. And I want to just take one minute. That was my second talk. What's my time? Uh, how does his work, so we're going to take what his content was, how does that inform where we go from here? And um, what he had this idea of sort of knowledge ecosystem, dynamic knowledge repository or whatever, self-archiving, all that kind of stuff. Just say, this is you, and this is all the stuff you do. Each node is all the things that you do that create and generate and collect all the stuff that you accumulate that ends up possibly in your archives. And, um, and so now, uh, you know, things accumulate, and really it looks more like this. And then now picture you are one of these nodes and it's the rest of your family or it's the community that you interact with and each one of those has a bleh, all of, uh, you know, archive stuff and uh, nobody is keeping track of anything and it just sort of scales up and gets out of control. Um, there it is again. So you can picture, okay, this is, uh, this is you at work interacting with all the people at work, and this is your team, one of these nodes is your team interacting with other teams, interacting with other initiatives, interacting with other organizations or um, you know, anywhere around the world, any time of day, and all the stuff that accumulates inside each of everybody's projects in each, every individual's workspace, and you know, it's just, it scales out the, from there. And so you can pull one thread and you, you know, it'll, who knows where, where it goes. Everybody's connected and everybody's part of this sort of collective intelligence of the world. You're part of the collective intelligence of your family, all through, back through generations, and the collective intelligence of the world, no matter what you're doing and how you, somehow you're contributing, hopefully, to advancing the collective intelligence of the world. And so, um, uh, we sort of put a name to that, my dad coined it, boosting collective IQ, so that's the handle. And so, um, what does that tell us? So, doing a little bit of analysis really quickly is, well, this boils down to actually three things, where you're collecting stuff, you're interacting, and you're developing stuff, you know, wedding invitation, your, bir your birthday invitation, uh, you know, those are knowledge products, and, uh, you know, you're, you're uh, accumulating, uh, you know, articles that, that named Aunt Edna or mentioned Uncle Fred. And, um, and then if you're at work, this is even bigger. You know, if you're designing an airplane, the, all the stuff that accumulates can fit in the airplane, and it probably won't fly. Um, so then, so there's three things, three types of things that accumulate, and then there's three sort of activities that are involved in moving all of that forward through your life. You're either de you're developing, you're integrating and applying knowledge and you're doing it all concurrently. And so not just collaboratively, but concurrently, and there's all this stuff going. So how does this inform the information technology? And uh, so tool requirements. So there's a long list and oops, of all, but some of the key things are uh, you want the knowledge and the tools to be open. You want them to be evolvable, migratable. Uh, I think I'm making it words uh, interoperable. Not not just technically interoperable, but the knowledge is interoperable. That you can take knowledge from any kind of sources and reconfigure and recompile and use it in in a lot of different ways. So you're harnessing the knowledge. <laughs> Did I miss a signal? <laughs> um, and it's permeable so that what Ted was talking about, the structure, that uh, there's stuff that can be embedded in documents that it knows you can collapse it and look at different views and come at it from different angles. And um, uh, identifiable, every object gets some kind of ID so that you can address it individually so that, you know, here's the footage somebody, somebody posted 
my daughter's play at school on a video, you know, on the internet. And so I want my grandmother to see the segment that shows my daughter. And so I want to be able to link to just that segment in the video. And so I need it to be that permeable and I need each frame to have an ID and all of that kind of stuff. So whatever media, whatever source, I need to be able to link into it, not just, I don't want to link you to a article when all I want you to see is the paragraph down here. I want to link, you can give you the link to the article, but also a link to the paragraph that I need you to see. So there's a long list and there's even some things missing, but one of the key points is that what we're talking about doing is sort of collapsing the distinction between personal, how you do stuff and, and how it gets accumulated and collected, and work. And so it really, it's, it's going to end up being all the same tools. Uh, but with a different flavor depending on uh, what you're using it for. And um, collapsing the distinction between individual and group is, you know, where, where's the boundary there? And privacy versus transparency, you cannot increase the collective IQ of a society if you don't have transparency. And so, but you also do need privacy. So these are a lot of issues that, the whole thing about um, what you see is what you get, what Ted was talking about, where they worried about how pretty it's going to look with the fonts and everything versus being able to allow structure and manipulatability and all of that kind of thing. My dad used to say, what you see is what you get. What you see is all you get. And um, another thing that uh, I just came up with is we've been hearing a lot about the term born digital. Well, I'm thinking born archival. <laughs> it's archive as you go. And, the system needs to do it for you, or as much as possible, and allow you know annotation and all that kind of stuff, so that on the fly, you know the context is set, all of that kind of stuff, and that it requires you know possibly um, new roles in the organization to help all of this stuff happen. So you know we have to think new paradigm about how we work together and how we do all of this, and that's it. Thank you very much.